the agenda for the talk. Just going to give you a little background to the history of mRNA production. A lot's happened since we began our uh, program in 2015, and we've seen an explosion, as Shell said, in the space. An implementation by several companies for uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic response. I'm going to give you some background on the SAM vaccine platform, talk a little bit about RNA production. This is the key component that's driven pharma and biotech to explore this. RNA is made in a cell-free process. It's made enzymatically. So its production system is very unlike anything that's used commercially today. And so in the combination with effective delivery system and synthetic production of RNA, you have what's known as a disruptive technology. Key to that is with effective delivery system and synthetic production of RNA, you have what's known as a disruptive technology. Key to that is how you deliver the RNA. I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, lipid nanoparticles. Then I'm gonna show you a real-time application. This was uh, a pandemic, uh, a potential pandemic outbreak that happened in China with an H7 uh, uh, N9 uh, bird flu that uh, infected three people in China. Uh, those patients died. The Chinese government sequenced the virus. And I'll show you how, in collaboration with synthetic genomics, we were able to show the power of the technology and develop a vaccine very rapidly. And then we're going to finish on a little discussion on large scale production of lipid nanoparticles. So, with that, I'll begin. Just a little bit of history about mRNA. Um, Novartis vaccines did not in invent uh, the concept. mRNA has been around for a very long time. The first um, uses of it came in 1990 with John Wolf and his group at the University of Wisconsin, where they did intramuscular injection into mice of both plasmid DNA and mRNA, expressing reported genes like beta-galactosidase, and they showed robust expression of those proteins. However, at that time, and for the next 10 years, it was certainly considered that mRNA was an unstable molecule and commercially wasn't very viable as a therapeutic entity. And we saw an explosion in the space with DNA. But people continue to explore it in an academic setting. We did see mRNA being used to generate immune responses in mice. And certainly in 1994, there was a publication of use of a self-amplifying RNA uh, in a vaccine setting in vivo. We saw in 1998 and the early 2000 an explosion in the RNA interference space where people were trying to deliver SI RNA systemically. And here we saw uh, the development of lipid nanoparticles being produced using ethanol dilution, a very viable uh, large-scale process to enable production of lipid uh, encapsulated nucleic acid. One of the earliest pioneers in the space was CureVac, and we saw them put together a GMP process, a small conventional RNA in the 2000s. We came on board in uh, 2008, I'm really going to talk to you about a paper we published in 2012 in PNAS about how we showed for the first time that a lipid nanoparticle could be used to deliver a, an mRNA vaccine in vivo and generate potent immune responses. We'll talk about how we responded to that uh, H7N9 uh, influenza virus uh, in China and conclude with talking about how you might consider scaling up lipid nanoparticles. So 2000, we had CureVac. 20 years on, this is what the landscape of mRNA vaccine space looks like. It's crowded. We've got biotech companies like CureVac, Moderna, and BioNTech, and they're partnering with big pharma entities uh, in multiple uh, therapeutic areas. There are three types of RNA. You have unmodified RNA, where you're enhancing stability and it's the translation of that RNA to protein by adding structural motifs. In the middle, you've got base modified RNA where the pioneering work of people like Drew Wiseman and Katie Carrico showed that you could introduce mammalian base modifications to damp down the innate immune response to that mRNA. 
And so uh, you have base modified mRNA. Thirdly, on the far end, I'm going to talk to you about self amplifying RNAs. These are engineered viral genomes that are capable of uh, self amplification, and it's the technology that we explored at Novartis. Over the weekend, I, I explored uh, you know, what was going on in uh, the coronavirus uh, vaccine development and found some information from the World Health Organization that was very interesting. Currently, uh, 44 candidates are being explored. And very interestingly, eight of them are based on mRNA. So why are we seeing an explosion and a rapid implementation of a, a new technology against conventional technologies like viral vectors and uh, protein subunit vaccines? It's because of the unconventional uh, way that RNA vaccines are made without cell culture. So this is the vision back in 2008 we had at Novartis Vaccines. Could we reinvent the gene vaccine and develop a completely synthetic vaccine approach that didn't have the complications of cell culture? We wanted to be safe, scalable, and a platform technology where you could develop develop several vaccines by just changing the sequence of the antigen that you encoded in the vector. We had um, a viral vector delivery system that we were developing at the time. It was a viral replicon particle. These viral replicon particles are produced uh, using a packaging cell line. So it's a self-amplifying RNA that is encapsulated in uh, a viral coat. The technology had been shown to work, is based on an alpha virus, been shown to work in human clinical trials by companies like Alphavax and shown to be potent and immunogenic. The difficulty was the scale up uh, and getting uh, production of those viral particles at type to China, and then the downstream uh, purification away from the cell debris. So the idea was to take the RNA out from that viral particle and put it, make it enzymatically and put it in a, a synthetic uh, lipid delivery system. So what is a self-amplifying RNA or sometimes called a replicon? It's a very large uh, messenger RNA. Conventional mRNA, both base modified and unmodified is around two to 3,000 bases. A replicon is around 10,000 bases, so very much larger, but it's like any mRNA. It has a five prime cap and a poly A tail. On the five prime end, it encodes the non-structural proteins, NSP1 to four. Uh, these, when uh, translated into protein, form the right viral replicates that allow self-amplification of the viral genome and expression of the structural proteins. In this case, we've deleted the structural proteins in that gene of interest cassette and inserted our viral antigen. So this vector is capable of self-amplification, expression of our antigenic protein. And I'm gonna talk about two antigens for vaccine applications today. One is the F glycoprotein from RSV and the other is hemagglutinin uh, from flu. There are no structural proteins from the alpha virus. Those would be the uh, E1 and E2 glycoproteins that are on the outer surface that uh, enable cell targeting and endosome escape, or the capsid protein that encapsulates the RNA underneath the lipid envelope that's uh, contained within the viral coat. So once we've delivered the RNA into the cell, it's able to self-amplify, but it can't escape and reinfect other cells. But it will stimulate uh, a, an antiviral response because it will be seen as a replicating viral genome. So how do these vaccines work? You make your RNA enzymatically, you encapsulate them in lipid nanoparticles, uh, you then do a conventional intramuscular injection, the lipid nanoparticles transfect a few muscle cells at the site of injection, the RNA launches, goes through its amplification process, expresses the viral protein or the antigen on the surface of that cell. During the amplification, it self-adjuvants because it's detected as a uh, replicating 
viral genome, and you get a potent immune response focused on that foreign protein that you're expressing at the cell surface. So mechanistically, this is what's going on at that muscle cell. Uh, we don't know how uh, the delivery mechanism is initiated, whether that's through a direct fusion event or through an endocytic pathway. But what we do know is that RNA makes it to the cytoplasm, it finds the ribosome, and we get translation of those non-structural proteins. They form the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which generates a negative sense copy of the RNA genome. So, and off that template, it either self-amplifies the full genome or it launches the sub-genome sub where the gene of interest is, is uh, encoded. We then get translation of that gene of interest or the antigen and it's expressed at the surface of the cell. The combination of immune stimulation through RNA amplification and that antigenic protein on the cell surface leads to a potent uh, immune response. So why is everyone so interested in mRNA vaccines? It's because it's a disruptive technology and the way you produce RNA is unlike any other conventional technologies. It's because it's a disruptive technology and the way you produce RNA is unlike any other conventional technologies. It doesn't require cell culture. RNA synthesis is achieved using an enzymatic transcription reaction. You take a DNA template, usually a plasmid, you linearize it, and within the plasmid, you have a promoter region that is recognized by T7 polymerase. T7 polymerase engages, and then in a sequence-dependent manner, it reads your RNA uh, vector and produces the transcript. All the materials used for this transcription reaction are generic other than the DNA template. So you have the four uh, nucleotide triphosphates, you have a, a capping mechanism, uh, and all of the enzymes that go into it. So it's a truly uh, platform approach. It's just the sequence that goes into the plasmid uh, that you change. In 2010, CureVac had scaled up production of conventional mRNA um, and made a GMP process and were conducting clinical trials. Uh, and you could buy commercial kits from companies like uh, Ambien uh, to make RNA at a milligram scale. Um, production of a much larger replicon hadn't been achieved, but we didn't consider uh, this to be insurmountable. And so on the far right hand side, you can see uh, a gel uh, where we made our 9KB replicon with either uh, an Ambien Megascript kit or we built our own in-house uh, transcription reaction uh, to produce the RNA, giving equivalent results. And you can see yields in the five uh, milligrams per mil range. So at a commercial scale, this is what your uh, mRNA production would look like. You have a cell-free synthesis bioreactor with all the enzymes and DNA uh, template, a purification module, sterile filtration, and then the RNA uh, drug substance ready for formulation. Uh, the composition of this transcription reaction is well-defined, and if you consider this to be a biologic, we're actually below uh, the specifications for contamination of protein and DNA set by the FDA for a biologic because it's an enzymatic transcription reaction. Using uh, chromatographical purification, you can essentially remove all the contaminating uh, proteins and, and DNA and end up with pure RNA. The process is generic, it can be disposable, and it's quite rapid. Uh, it can a typical transcription reaction can take between two to four hours. So the whole process can be completed uh, within days in a, a GMP suite. Yields are typically five to six milligrams per mil. And if we were to uh, estimate a human dose of uh, a vaccine to be 100 micrograms, we'd be producing between 50 and 60 human doses per mil. And these are yields that have been unheard of uh, using conventional cell culture technologies. 
I want to go on to show 